So I say, folks, this week is part two build, it's about build an operation of our no added cost series, how to build a low energy home without the premium cost. Um, and this is quite an intriguing area. We found that a number of uh, clients and, and, and customers and architects are, are really intrigued by this. I think this is, this is the crux, which is stopping a lot of people really, really going at sustainable building because there's a, a disbelief um, or a belief, should I say, that building low energy buildings is expensive. And a lot of that comes from passive house uh, and, you know, using very, very, very specialist contractors or very, very, very specialist products. Um, and, you know, because they were few and far between, the, the prices were quite inflated or you needed to do a lot of compliance work to, uh, to you know, to get there, to get the badges. You know, passive house is a, is a really good example. Um, so what we're trying to uncover here, we're, we're trying to simplify this. We, we're going to go into a case study, but we're going to go through some of the background. And what's really important to understand here, and, and hopefully this will become clear, is that, you know, that is quickly becoming not the case. Just with some proper consideration on, on projects, you can deliver low energy buildings for not a great deal of extra cost. And that's what I want to talk about in this particular webinar. So. I say for the benefit of people who haven't been on these webinars, I've just spent 60 seconds explaining what Mesh Energy is about. Um, we are independent energy consultants and, and essentially we come from a place of independence um, and holistic advice. And our sole purpose in being is, is centered around making sure that whoever we work with gets a you know, a, a truly outstanding project. It's easy to deliver sustainable goals and, and to deliver sustainable design. And so we often find ourselves working with architects, with private clients, with developers, um, and, and all manner of buildings. But we're not sponsored by manufacturers. You know, we've got, you know, we've got no skin in the game if we, uh, you know, recommend installers. All we're trying to do is, is work with design teams and make that process as seamless and possi as possible. Um, and increasingly, you know, education and sharing inf of information is really key to, to tackling what is an immense problem uh, ahead of us. So this, this forms part of that. And, and that, that really summarizes what, what Mesh Energy is about. Um, and I guess just as a final word, we can help with any part of your project. We, we don't just focus on SAP calculations or building, um, you know, fabric design or, you know, assistance with commissioning at the back end, we can help with any phase of a project, even pre-planning and kind of conceptual design. And that makes, makes us pretty unique. So onwards and upwards. What we'll be covering this morning um, is looking at the evolving building construction um, kind of process and, and what goes into that and, and the focus uh, for, for low energy buildings. We'll be looking uh, quickly at the energy hierarchy. If you're not familiar with this principle, we, we've talked about this number of times. Um, it's also mentioned in the book that we've got. Um, but fundamentally, where is, where is it smartest to, to spend your project budget? Every part of a project is not equal. Um, believe me when I tell you that. And so it's easy to waste money on projects, just, but with some logical thought, you can make the very most out of the, out the, 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 the finite budget that you've got. So we'll go into that a bit. We'll look at build cost sensitivity and improved performance. Um, and a simple way of saying that is that as you better insulate walls and floors and ceilings and things like that, you improve the thermal performance, but the cost goes up. And so it's having a look at, uh, having a look at really what that means using kind of traditional building methods and we quantify that <clears throat> but also um, we're looking at air tightness costs of improving air tightness as well as re some renewable energy costs and we've got a table that we've put together that you can take that away which helps you to ballpark how much extra you've got to spend to, to get better and better building performance um, and we've used reba 2030 as a, as a kind of a benchmark framework for that and then we get into finally the nuts and bolts of case study um, and then look at the cost benefits of that and how the numbers shake, shake out for that. And then we'll give you some kind of key takeaways at the end. So where do we start? So evolving building construction and focus. So low energy building construction, I mean, there's, there's a lot changing across the board, but particularly with 
low energy building construction, there's a number of things changing, which are opportunities, are risks, are scaring people, are you know, are going to create some fantastic companies and some fantastic different ways of working together as teams. And I want to share with you that that briefly, because I, I think hopefully the whole purpose of this is that is enlightening and hopefully teaches you something you don't already know. So regulation wise, we're seeing tighter building regulation targets um, over the last decade. Those have tightened considerably. The next decade ahead of us, we will see um, harder and faster tightening of building regulations. You know, we're going to start seeing pressure on overheating analysis, on embodied carbon, on um, operational energy, you know, building regulations, you know, the stick approach to building buildings uh, will, uh, you know, will get strong pretty, pretty rapidly once we're over this little wobble that we're in at the moment. Fabric efficiency and, and air tightness are the kind of the key factors behind that. So, um, you know, looking at more modern materials, looking at clever ways to improve fabric efficiency, but also a real focus on quality of build and, and air tightness. So making sure that our buildings are less leaky, but in the process, making sure that air quality is maintained and health and well-being is maintained to a high level as well. So that those two kind of key areas, as you see, they're quite high in the energy um, hierarchy that we'll be looking at. But that is how, how buildings will rapidly change because those have big effects on the energy usage of a building. We've got new construction methods. So um, structural insulated panels or SIPs panels as they're known will be used more readily. Um, it remains to be seen how that can be done in a, in a, in a kind of a delightful embodied carbon way, but we're talking about pre-manufacture, we're talking about insulated concrete formwork. There's a lot of work being done in the concrete sector to reduce the embodied carbon there. We've, modular construction is the, you know, is the new kind of trendy thing to talk about and people are trying to, trying to explore how that works. So away from bricks and mortar and timber construction, there's all this, you know, this growing plethora of other ways of building buildings, higher quality buildings, better quality assured buildings. And, and taking work off site that we've got to get our heads around. Uh, more integrated services. So a lot of us are used to underfloor heating. You know, obviously that is put on the floor, you put a screed over it, but there are people putting it in structural slabs. You've got in-roof solar panels. You've got ducting for mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, which are going in roof voids. You've got built-in speakers into walls. You've got all kinds of things which are you know, becoming a kind of key arteries and tributaries within a building. And the, the level of integration of services is becoming a real headache and, uh, you know, requires a, a new way of designing buildings rather than doing it in the old fashioned linear way of designing a building. Then you hand it over to the M&E consultant and then he hands it over to the builder. That is, that is becoming old school pretty quickly. And then you've got you know, new technologies, new renewable technologies as we get off oil and gas, LPG, electric storage heaters, there are technologies to replace those. Um, and, and that involves a lot of integrated technology as well. But also with all of this, with all, of, with all this change and, and some of these new materials which aren't quite mass market yet, and, and, and some would argue quite a long way off mass market, some of these things are more expensive. Um, and and that, that creates increased budget pressures, particularly um, putting materials to one side. If you're changing the design process, you may have to do thinking at the beginning of a project more readily. That's as far as the client or, or, or the cost profile is concerned for that project. There's more upfront cost, which again is seen as a bigger risk or, or, or a bigger issue for um, clients and uh, you know and key stakeholders. So <clears throat> that is that is one of the other things that's changing as well. Is um, in the short term budget pressures, although budget pressures will always be there. Um, but how we look at consultancy and, and some of the key services and asking for the right advice at the right times. So I mentioned, I mentioned as part of the thing that's changing this focus on building fabric and, and air tightness. Um, and that, that comes from kind of a, a very much common sense point of view. Um, you know, passive house has its big strengths and also has its big weaknesses, but passive house principles, which look at building fabric and um, form, uh, air tightness and, and various other things is is all built around common sense and that, that that's been around for decades uh, I think since the early 90s if I remember correctly and 
I when I when I wrote a book about this, I wanted to distill um, these kind of key principles to building design and uh, common sense into it into a really really simple graphic. And this is what I came up with, and this draws on a, a lot of information. But the benefit here is, other than it being kind of common sense from a building physics point of view, is at the top of this inverted triangle, every pound spent within reason on this hierarchy higher up, you save more pounds, you know, if you, if you invest in the right order. So, <clears throat> to, you know, a, a lot of sites um, are restricted by, you know, the way that you can orientate a building. Um, you're not necessarily restricted by form. Um, but it, at, at the bare minimum, uh, you know, taking it to extremes, a, a spherical building or a cubic building is more energy efficient than one with wings and tentacles and, and all kinds of things where you've got a high uh, area to, to floor plan ratio. And so at the top of this triangle, it's all about form and orientation. Is the house above ground? Is it below ground? Is it in a valley? Is it at the top of an exposed hill? We're talking about those kinds of things. <coughs> um, but if we, if we assume for most sites that we have a, a reasonable amount of strong criteria which are restricting too much variation at that stage, where most projects can have the biggest effect is actually in fabric element design. And for many, many years, and still today, uh, you know, there's a lot of lazy design out there. A lot of people are scraping by building uh, regulations with bare bones, notional um, U-values for fabric, key fabric elements, and missing a big trick. And I'll show you in, in the slide after this, you know, what, what we're talking about. So after you focus on building fabric, you're looking at air tightness and ventilation. Beyond that, you're looking at renewable technologies. Beyond that, you're looking at lighting and appliances, and then how you're using the building down at the bottom. Um, you know, a classic example here is people jump to the shiny kind of air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, solar panels, batteries, all that kind of stuff, and forget about the top three layers of this hierarchy. And in the process, um, create very expensive homes to, to run because they may not be suitable for that technology and they put in bigger equipment than they need to because the home is losing more energy than it needs to. Unfortunately, the top, often the top three layers of this hierarchy are, are pretty boring and pretty hidden. You could argue that form, certainly for an architect, isn't very boring, but fabric design and air tightness is hidden, is boring. It's, you know, you can't show your friends it after you've built the house, but those, those, uh, those key areas are, are critical. And we'll be talking particularly uh, over the next half an hour about fabric element design, air tightness and renewable technology. And when you look at the effect that this hierarchy has on the total energy usage of a building, um, again, this is a simple graphic, but those three sectors that I was talking about cover the lion's share of an energy usage of a building. Now, you could argue that building geometry, location and orientation change the size of that circle based on the form. But if you assume that's fixed and you have a fixed design beyond that, Tackling the first three layers of this hierarchy, you could go a long, long way to reducing energy usage of a building by 80%, 70%. And this is why it makes sense to do it from the top down. If you start tackling energy bills with renewable technology, you're focusing on this little pink area. Um, and it may be that you, you know, you, um, don't get the opportunity to tackle the, the green and yellow areas on that pie chart. And, and again, you're, you're throwing your client's money away by, by doing so. So overall, start with fabric first. Um, your money on, on fabric is always, is always the best spent, um, not least for the reasons that I've, I've covered there. But fabric is, fabric is passive. You know, fabric doesn't break down. Fabric doesn't need maintenance. Fabric will outlast every single person on this call and probably the next generation to come if it's done properly. So um, it's boring, but 
your, your money is well spent. It has a lot of other knock-on positive effects through the project. Then air tightness. So look at the construction of the building, maybe con the construction methodology and pay extra attention. You know, we, we talk increasingly about air tightness champions when it comes to construction. It not only needs to be um, flagged as an important point, but it also needs to be executed. So focusing on air tightness can have a, a massive effect. Often when we run figures on new build properties, air tightness can uh, affect the running costs of a building by 25%. So just a bit more uh, focus on that uh, can have long, 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 long lasting effects. Then we're talking about heat, uh, generating heat and, and energy efficiently through these renewable technologies, solar panels, heat pumps, that kind of thing. So, um, getting into the nuts and bolts of this, that's fine in theory, but let's, let's start talking about some numbers and some real way of, of achieving this. I wanna give you guys some, some takeaways here rather than just talking about airy-fairy kind of principles. And the best way that I could think of doing this was talking about where we are and using the REBA 2030 guideline here, where we could be in 2025 and, and where we need to be uh, in, in 2030 based on that, on, that, on that framework. If you're not familiar with REBA 2030, we've done webinars on it. There's loads of stuff on the web, but watch our videos first. Um, we've written some blogs about it as well, which we'll be launching next week. Uh, so read up on that. But this assumes that you, you've got a basic understanding of the REBA 2030 targets. So <clears throat> when, when we initially did some work on this at the beginning of the year, we came up with this kind of really handy lookup table. And that, that that gave you guidelines as to where you need to be with key elements of a building, what you could get away with as far as air tightness, uh, heating and hot water and ventilation. And I'm going to use those blocks out of here to, to, for the remainder of this slide. So this is giving you an idea at the moment of current building regulations. We've just got some notional U values there for the key fabric elements. And so what we're saying is if you design a building to this, you're, you're going to hit current regs. Air tightness, we've got it at five cubic meters per square meters per hour. So this is, if you do an air pressure test on a building, this is the number that we're, we're looking at here. So five is a, is a really good number and, and pretty standard. Heating and hot water, we're looking at mains gas. Uh, and ventilation, just standard mechanical ventilation, you know, pull cords in bathrooms and extractor hood in the kitchen, that kind of stuff. Nothing fancy, just straight mechanical ventilation. Now, if we jump ahead five years, um, this is this is how some of these u values need to need to start changing so the walls have, have come down by quite a considerable margin the roofs and floors have been tweaked a bit um windows have been been tightened further you know we're on the edge of double glazing there and air tightness and you know those kind of values have really been screwed down once you get down to you know two three uh, or, or sub those figures you really got to start paying attention. You could achieve five pretty easily, um, you know, three or below. You've got to start paying some attention, else you could find yourself well, well out of uh, well out of spec on that. And we're into heat pump territory here, so you're not going to be able to heat twenty hit twenty twenty five targets by just putting in a gas boiler. And ventilation, because of these low air tightness figures, um, you, you're going to need mechanical ventilation and heat recovery to properly move air around the building, ventilate the building, uh, and, and have a system operating in a building that is, uh, you know, is, is, is much air tighter than the ones we're delivering today. Um, and also that's gonna really help you with your operational energy as well. Now, if we jump to the end of the decade, we're down to you know, 0.1 for roofs and walls, we're down to triple glazing for windows, we're down to sub, uh, one cubic meter per square meter per hour for air tightness tests, looking at definitely heat pumps and you're still sticking with MVHR. Um, we won't go into solar and things like that at the, at the minute, but it's likely that you're gonna need some form of solar panels on a building at that stage to make it, can make it compliant. And when you look at uh, the 2030 um, band here, this is, I put pH equivalent, apologies for using acronyms here, we're talking about passive house. This is kind of passive house standard by the end of the decade. When you look at the passive house targets and when you look at REBA 2030, it picks up on, on those. Um, air tightness is slightly slacker, but as far as um, building fabric, that's where you're at. You're at the passive house standard by the end of the decade. No mean feat. But the reason that I cite this is because we're going to look at how building fabric costs are affected as you 
hit these targets to give you an idea and debunk some of the myths you may have in your own, your own mind as to how severe that is. So I, I guess an obvious question is why aren't we doing this today? You know, I, I think we all increasingly get the idea that, that using less energy is great um, and we'd all love to be, that we'd all love to be doing it. So the question is why aren't we? What are the hurdles? What are the big things in the way? The problem is that to improve building fabric, um, we've got to add, add more stuff. We've got to add more insulation. Um, and building fabric is a large part of the budget. So when you say, oh, right, okay, we've got to you know, add more cost to something that's already a large part of the budget, that, that, can, be quite scary for, <laughs> that can be quite scary for the clients. And certainly without the figures to back it up, um, a lot of, conclu a lot of um, conclusions get, get jumped to and, and sometimes it's no, 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 we'll do what we need to. And if we have to spend smaller amounts of money improving things, then we can handle that. So sometimes it can just be scary because building fabrics a large part of the budget already. Um, but uncertainty and not running the numbers is a, is a big issue because without the right information, the, the wrong decisions get made. There are also the, the kind of the wider benefits of improving building fabric insulation or air tightness are, are not understood and, and the sensitivities. And what I mean by that is you can spend more money on the building fabric, but save more money on your heating system. And a lot of people focus on the extra money you're spending and they don't necessarily realize that you can save money in other areas. Um, and, and so you don't get the full picture. And again, people see costs coming up and then don't necessarily see costs coming down in, in other areas. The other problem is, is, is branding. And, and what I mean by that is Passive House is a very, very strong brand. A lot of people have heard of Passive House and a lot of us may know people that have built Passive House houses or may have done them as a practice. And they're not cheap. They're, they are always more expensive than just building a run of the mill home. The problem is to get Passive House accreditation, um, there's a lot of hoops that you've got to jump through and a lot of unnecessary, in my, in my humble opinion, a lot of unnecessary cost that gets added on for accreditation and things. You may end up with a superlative house, uh, but it costs you a lot of money to get there. And, you, you, and that sticks in people's minds. You think low energy, you think high build costs. And so we need to break that. We need to break out of that. So <clears throat> when we look at, at, at kind of build cost sensitivity. I want, to, I want to run you through some of the elements and how these are affected. So as we improve the insulation qualities of roofs, walls, floors, that kind of thing, how much does the, how much does the relative cost actually change? So we've got here glazing, we've got um, different types of um, walls, and also we've got floors on this same graph. So we've got U values on the horizontal axis, and we've got cost per square meter on the vertical axis. And I've done some typical ranges here. So you can, let's pick double glazing or glazing, which is the, is the one at the top here. So double glazing, if you're around the 1.4 mark, you're paying roughly maybe 300 quid a square meter. Um, if you go up to triple glazing, so if you go up to that 2030 standard, you've, that cost has risen by 50% up to about 450 pounds a square meter. Obviously, there's variation on these, but generally speaking, that's the, the kind of variation that you're looking at. So reducing that U value by half, you've got to add 50% to that single element. And if you look at walls like um, brick and block and timber frame, which are very, very similar in most cases, you've got a U value there of maybe 0.18 that you're starting with. Um, and if you go to 0.1 or around the 0.1 mark, actually there's, very, there's, a, there's actually very little increase in cost. Same with insulated concrete formwork. Um, the reason is, is because actually all you're doing is bolting on insulation in most cases. You know, I haven't gone to the nth degree and factored in, you know, widening footings and stuff like that. But most of the increasing cost here is, is extra expanded polystyrene insulation or, or PIR insulation or what other insulation that you're, that you're using. So you really don't see too much change there. And the same, the same for, um, floors really and, and roofs. It's all about the extra insulation that you're adding. But I thought this was quite a good graphic to give you an idea of how this stuff, how this stuff looks in the grand scheme of things. So 
one of the other things that's interesting to pick up on here is if you have a building I, I've, I've seen people do this before focus on glazing before they focus on improving the fabric insulation of a building and this shows you why you should why you shouldn't do that not only is glazing a smaller percentage of a building surface area but proportionally to increase the u value it costs you a small fortune to do that so why not do that to the building fabric first you may even be able to keep some lesser insulation, uh, uh, some window um, insulation values in there. Um, so, so you can read into some of this stuff and, and see some immediate cost savings without going to the nth degree. So, if we look at if we look again at, at walls, this is just a more detailed look at um, insulated concrete formwork, brick and block, and, and timber frame. You know, as I say, timber frame and brick and block are, are pretty similar. And this just gives you a bit more, a bit more detail. It kind of zooms in on the graph. And you see, you can see kind of fractional increases as you improve MEU values. And that just comes from insulation. Air tightness is, a, is an interesting one. Um, a lot of people, myself included, think air tightness is quite a tricky beast to pin down. How can you ever pin down costs for improving air tightness. Seems like this kind of ethereal floating thing, which is, is fine to have an air pressure test done for or set as a specification. But how is the cost impacted if you, if you meet some of, uh, you know, if you, if you meet increasing levels of uh, air tightness? And the honest answer is it varies depending on your construction method. Um, so, it's slightly finger in the air, but we have got some numbers to, to, to help you out. I say the, the, the worst culprits really are timber frame buildings um, and timber masonry buildings, if there's an element of timber in there, but also SIPs construction buildings as well. They, they need particular attention. Um, timber is, is obviously you know, permeable and off in, in most cases, you'll often need to put in dedicated membranes, be taping joints. There are products out there. Um, I don't know if you guys have, have come across kind of, uh, you know, these kind of spray on um, air tightness barriers that you can put. There's a, there's a purple and a white one. I'm not going to say any more than that. Um, so there are solutions and you can get kind of square meter application um, values, values for those. If you're building something out of insulated concrete formwork, you know, not a lot of air gets through 300 millimeters of concrete. So yeah, if it's done properly, you've almost got an airtight building there before you go any further. And it's just penetrations for key services through the floor slab or the, or the walls or the roof that you need to focus on. So it really does depend on the, on the building fabric um, air tightness and the costs associated with that. The other, the other important thing to mention here as well is, and we will get more familiar with this, but air tightness or infiltration values down to three cubic meters per square meters per hour, which is about the threshold where you start thinking about mechanical ventilation heat recovery, can be achieved with high quality construction alone. So don't get sucked into, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're getting better than, than five air changes. We must need to spend, you know, 10,000 pounds to improve the air tightness of this building. You can go down to about three just by finding a high quality builder that focuses on detail, you know, properly foams up joints, properly details, uh, junctions, and th that can be done. Don't, don't get carried away. But below that, you're going to need to start spending more money on it. And the number that we came up with here that might be worth bearing in mind is budgeting roughly 10 to 15 pounds per square meter once you're down below kind of one cubic meter per square meter per hour as far as infiltration goes. Once you're down below three, you know, you could, um, you know, you could probably half that value uh, or, or put in a notional value that it's lower than, lower than these figures. But that was the best information that we kind of came up with based on our experience and our, our research. Renewable technology costs, which are this kind of third, third band here, is, uh, you know, as building performance improves, um, Renewable technology is more expensive. And this is one of the reasons that we suggest that you hold off from renewable technology and spend your money in other areas. Historically, people have over-designed 
uh, gas boilers, oil boilers, LPG boilers, all kinds of other fossil fuel technology because it's cheap and you can get away with it. When you get into renewable technology and sophisticated modern day building design, you know, you're after lean systems. You're not after things which are, you know, have a factor of safety of, you know, two or 10 in them. You're after a system that is covering, you know, with a tiny, tiny extra margin, what that building needs in, in, the, in the depths of winter or depths of summer or however you're designing the building. So you need to invest in, in more expensive renewable technology. Mechanical ventilation and heat recovery systems will quickly become a must have because of the air tightness values that you've got to get to. So there's only so far you can go with mechanical ventilation. And as I said before, solar PV or solar photovoltaic panels, um, you know, will have to be integrated as well. So that's another cost that you've got to bear in mind that your projects might not be used to by the end of the decade. But as I mentioned before, as building heat loss, um, reduces because you spent money on the fabric of the building, you can squeeze down the costs of your heating technologies. You know, in passive house using that term again, uh, the singularity there is you don't need a heating system. So that's, that's actually what you can get to. It costs you quite a lot of money to get there, but that's what you can get to as your kind of the, the holy grail. But even by getting 80% of the way there, way there, you can massively, uh, reduce the costs associated with capital equipment for heating the building um, because you spent that money more intelligently in the fabric of the building. But also as something that other people don't think about as we electrify our buildings, putting in heat pumps, mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems, electric vehicle charge points, all that kind of stuff, is that um, we've got electrical supplies that need to be upgraded. So that's another uh, additional project cost. But also um, one of the other things driving down costs is on-site power generation from, from solar PV as well. So there's a few other variables here which are creeping in as buildings get more energy efficient and become more electrified. So again, by way of giving you a, a kind of a summary table here, um, we've got in the vertical columns, we've got current building regulations 2025 and, and 2030 as targets. And we've broken down the different technology costs here. And we've got what the, the typical costs are, um, assuming a kind of a 280, 300 square meter floor area building. And you can now look across this table and see what you would need to, uh, see what you would need to do for, for the various um, target years. So you can see some of these things are going up, but some of these things are going down. If you look at air source and ground source, the costs of those technologies are going down because you're better insulating the building. And we'll come into, you know, we'll come onto the case study and see how this shakes out as a whole. But I say, hopefully this is, um, this is useful information for you guys. So a case study, we'll spend the next kind of 10, 15 minutes talking about a case study and looking at the kind of cost benefit analysis of a, uh, of a real project. Um, I want to give a shout out here to BWP Architects who helped us with some of their data off a live project and Isosceles um, who are a uh, QS uh, just based in uh, kind of Guildford Way who've helped us with some of this data as well just making sure that it wasn't our uh, you know our information alone um, and that it, that it was more um, widely considered. So this case study um, is a project called Wayside um, it was actually done by Beach Architects a new build, 280 square meters, build cost of uh, just shy of uh, kind of 600,000. Roughly speaking, kind of 2,000 pounds per square meter. It was made out of SIPs panels, had a concrete raft, triple glazing, um, a really, really low uh, infiltration rate. And it was almost kind of passive house. Um, and lo and behold, it had an EPC rating of, a really good EPC rating of A. So a really low energy building. And to give you a bit more information about this, this is the way that the building was designed as far as details. And this is actually comes from a, uh, a company in Ireland who do kind of preformed uh, pre building solutions. So they've got this kind of twin wall system, which is coming out of 0.1 uh, as a U value, passive foundation, which is actually less than 0.1. So it uses EPS, uh, a reinforced concrete structural slab uh, with underfloor heating in there. 
um, and they guarantee air tightness values below 0.6. Um, and just for your wider information, if you go down the route of these kind of projects, you're looking at about 700 pounds a square meter for the entire system, um, which is roughly equivalent to kind of 200 pounds a square meter for the, for the wall element for SIPs. Um, but there is a cheaper way. You can, you know, there are, you can use modern, uh, well, traditional techniques for building a low energy house. You haven't got to go down passive house, SIPs panels and all that kind of stuff. And this is what I wanted to bring to your attention and then show you, show you the kind of the cheaper end and how this can be achieved. So we, if we take a standard brick and timber frame building here, um, you've got brick outer face, you've got a cavity, OSB, timber frame, 200 millimeter timber frame that's got PIR in it. Um, you've got vapor air tightness barriers, another layer of OSB, some battens and some plasterboard. The construction's there, it's a kind of a typical Kingspan construction that we've taken off their website. And you can build that for 168 pounds a square meter. It will take a few quid. That's, that's roughly what, it, what it's about. So it is cheaper than, it's, it's cheaper than SIPS, if SIPS is coming out about 200 pounds a square meter. But you still get that point one, and it's not a newfangled construction technique. It's one we all all should be very very familiar with. So, <clears throat> the one I showed you for the case study is right down there at twenty thirty standards. Um, you've got uh, a SIPS panels construction MBC there that I've written in the bar. MBC timber is a timber frame. Uh, a company called NBC. They're, they're, they're the ones based in Ireland. But that's where they were, and, and that they're their 2030 target. But if we get a bit more um, sensible or more affordable about how you achieve this and look at the timber and brick construction, if you look at building regs, you can achieve that for a build cost of around 1,600 quid a square meter. If you look at the 2025 standard and add some more insulation, it's fractionally more. And when you get to the 2030 standard, you can build this for around 1800 pounds a square meter um, if you use that construction method. So it is cheaper than buying a, a pre, you know, a, a, a pre-manufactured system. Obviously you've got to put a bit more effort into the air tightness. Um, you know, it's not, not guaranteed. You've got to put the effort in there, but this shows you how that changes through those, through those REBA 2030 targets, uh, you know, with a, with a more um, understandable, and, and, and more used system that anybody can do. So for this case study, if you um, look at the building regulations version of this, and I believe this is building regulations, the, sorry, this isn't, this is the 2030 one of this. If you build the 2030 version of this house, you have a peak winter energy load of less than four kilowatts, which is about 40 kilowatt hours per square meter. So that is approaching passive house. It's not quite there by passive house standards, but it's very, 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 very close. Your heating bills are down to seven, less than 750 quid. So this is for a house that's 300 square meters, just under. Your hot water is about 90 quid. Your ventilation costs using mechanical ventilation, ventilation heat recovery systems about 100 quid because you're using electricity to run that system. If you put solar panels on it, <clears throat> which this particular building did, they put four kilowatts on, um, you save about 500 quid's worth of electricity and your lighting and power is, is about 600 pounds um, in addition. So your total net annual running costs for that building would be about a thousand pounds. Um, and if you included the RHI subsidy, which um, I'm not going to go into, but it's a, a tax-free domestic subsidy, the renewable heat incentive, um, pays out for seven years tax-free. Um, you get about a thousand. You get about 970 quid for a building of that design uh, if you if you went for that subsidy, and that subsidy is still available. And net. So if you look at the running costs of that building plus the renewable heat incentive, that's just over hundred pounds a year net to run that building. So <clears throat> when, you, when you look at the costs of improving building fabric, air tightness and renewable technology, those are coming out at a 26% um, they're 26% of the overall um, 
cost of the construction. And to get from building regulations to REBA 2030 standards, this almost passive house standard, we reckon is about in that 184, 185 pound a square meter mark, in addition to the notional build costs of a project. So if you look at how much money you would generally spend on a building anyway, which, you know, that could range from a low spec building, maybe 1800 quid per square meter to maybe two and a half to six, if you're building a super duper building um, as a high spec, this is the kind of the range that we're talking about. And when we look at 184 quid as part of that range, this is what that looks like. So, you know, to, to give up a small amount of specification or a small amount of additional cost per square meter, you're going to see some radical changes and benefits to the running cost and the energy efficiency of the home. And I'll show you that on the next slide. So I just wanted to put that in proportion by way of a, or into perspective, shall I say, by way of, uh, of a graphic. So to mention again, if you built a building regulations with kind of brick and timber construction, you're around the kind of the 1600 quid mark. To build to 2025, you raise that by about five or 6%, um, the build cost of the project. And if you build to 2030 standards, you're raising that by just shy of 10% to reach those standards. But that's one part of the equation. So you've said to a client, look, it's gonna cost you slightly more. You've got to invest slightly more in this building, but let me show you let me show you what this is gonna, gonna result in. So now if we look at the running costs, so we've kept you know, the, the, the relative um, costs of the, of the building. If you look at building fabric um, at, at building regulations level, it will cost you about 1900 quid a year to run, that, um, to run that building for heating and hot water. If you improve that to 2025 targets, forget subsidy for the minute, just forget that because that will run out. If you forget that, you could drop your running costs by almost 30% by spending another five or 6% on the building. And this is for the lifetime of the building. So one-off additional cost, slight additional cost, and you're reducing your running costs by 30%. If you build to 2030 standards, you can reduce your um, running costs. And this is everything. When I'm talking about running costs, I'm not just talking about heating costs. I'm talking about everything, lighting, electricity, ventilation, the whole shooting match. I'm not being, if I was, if I was presenting you a graph here of the heating costs, this would be going down to, you know, 80% saving. We're talking about total costs of the building. So you're spending almost, almost 10% on top of building regs, you know, kind of a standard build. You can reduce the lifetime running cost of the building by over 40%. And if you factor in the RHI, this, this domestic heating center for the first seven years, you see a radical drop off in costs. So for the first seven years, you'll follow this kind of dotted line, depending on where the client's pitching the building. But then after that, you know, you're raised to still significant savings over and above a kind of a standard home. And the final thought I want to leave you guys with just before we wrap up in the takeaways is some of the difficulty here is, you know, clients can be sensitive, but there's a big, big angle here increasingly to do with marketing and the resale value of the building. So you may have clients who are going to be living in it and this doesn't concern them, but undoubtedly the energy efficiency of a building will improve. And there was a study done back in 2013, if I remember correctly, I've got the link to it down here on the, on the slide. And what it was saying is essentially at that time, if you built a current building regs home, it was, it was kind of high D. Now we're about kind of low to middling C if you build a current uh, home to, to standard building regulations. And what it was saying is, if you improve to a B rating or an A rating a home, based on, on statistical data of, of houses being sold and bought, the value of that property would increase. And there was a value to selling that building. So if you built a 2030 home, you'd be well up in the A category. And as a minimum, the house value would increase by, by 3%, possibly as much as 5% um, when you get up into that A grade. Now this is, you know, th this is gonna re require some more work and I, I genuinely hope that somebody reruns this report over the next couple of years to see 
you know, to, to get a more realistic effect of, of how uh, this is in, in, in this decade. Um, but you can imagine this will only grow as people are more and more interested in, in low energy buildings. So to kind of wrap up here, uh, increased cost for low energy homes um, due to inf improved fabric insulation. You're not gonna get away from that. You know, there's no silver bullet here. You have to better insulate homes, you have to spend more money on the fabric, but there are savings in other areas. The cheapest method of constructing homes is, is timber or, or timber and brick, uh, based on you know, kind of square meter build cost, um, based on the research that we've done. Air tightness costs and detail um, increase with, with timber construction. So, so bear that in mind, there may be an additional cost if you are building in timber. Capital equipment costs do rise, um, but if you improve the efficiency of a building, those costs overall will, will decline. So it's a more expensive technology, but you can make savings by investing money in the fabric of the building. And generally speaking, to build to REBA 2030 standards, 2025 is about 6%, 5 or 6%, and 2030 is probably a 10% uplift on the, on the building. But the running costs for getting any subsidies that you get can drop by 30 to 42%, roughly speaking, respectively. And this can be done with proper planning of the, of the, of the build from kind of first principles. And finally, just a bit, a bit about there about the, uh, the, the house value increase um, is an interesting discussion that you can have with your clients as well and something you could bring into the, bring into the mix uh, also. So that's it. I think we've done, we've done enough on that this week. Um, is there anything that you guys want to wanna ask us? We've got kind of 10 minutes. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, I can see there's one from... Isabel um, asking about whether the new standards can be achieved without having to use mechanical ventilation. Um, does the running cost include the maintenance cost of the equipment as well? So, so two questions there for Isabella. The first one, um, the new standards, depending on how far you go, you will not be able to hit the 2030 standard without mechanical ventilation heat recovery. 2025, it's highly unlikely, but you might just be able to scrape through. Every building is different. So um, if you really you know, tick every other box, it may be, may be that you might just be able to, to hit the 2025 standard if you've done a superlative job in the other areas. Uh, I, I, you know, it's always worth running the numbers. I, I'd hate to, to say yes or no one way or the other. But generally speaking, I would prepare yourself for learning more about mechanical ventilation, heat recovery in, in new buildings. Uh, the running costs, um, in the running costs that we included, we didn't include for maintenance. It's a funny one, mechanical ventilation and heat recovery. And the reason I say it's a funny one is because it's such a, a, a primitive technology. Um, funnily enough, that leads us on to uh, talking about next week's webinar, which is a masterclass on mechanical ventilation heat recovery that my colleague David Reed uh, is, is going to be presenting. But fundamentally, mechanical ventilation heat recovery is, is simply ducts and a heat exchanger. For most people, it is well within the maintenance regime to change your filter, wash it out, rinse it out, dry it, put the filter back in. You don't need an annual maintenance regime that's going to cost you 100 quid or 200 quid for an installer to come around and do a proper job on it. Of course, that's something you can choose to do. Practically, a lot of mechanical ventilation heat recovery systems just get forgotten about um, <laughs> and left. That's not the right thing to do. Um, so the maintenance cost needn't be excessive at all and is well within uh, you know, a, a homeowner's capability to maintain that um, at, at, at a basic uh, a basic level. Of course, if you had an error light or something like that, then you call the engineers in. But generally speaking, it's not a meaningful cost to build in on an annual basis. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, that is, that is it, guys. Has anybody else got uh, another question as well as Isabella? I'll give you a few more moments, otherwise we can, uh, we can wrap it up. As I say, Rhiannon's gonna send out a copy of this presentation. We're gonna be putting uh, the uh, YouTube version of this um, up 
as 